mode. mode. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. The subject is teaching in Kazakhstan. I'd recommend that if you don't have one already, you get yourself a pen and a piece of paper because there'll be some contact details provided at the end of the session, and it'd be a good idea to write those down. Additionally, if you have any questions that you're already thinking about, please do feel free to just type them into the text box at the bottom of your screen as we go along. You don't have to wait until the end. We'll be answering them at the end, but please feel free to ask them as we go along this evening. So the first thing that we'll talk about is Kazakhstan itself. It's a, a country that not many people know very much about. So having a look at this map, we can see where it's located globally. It's in Central Asia, and it's bordered by Russia and China, and also by some other possibly less known countries like Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. So it's a large country. It's the largest country in Central Asia. Its capital is Astana, although historically the capital was Almaty. So after Kazakhstan became independent in 1991, the president decided that it was time to have a new capital, and Astana was a purpose-built city and um, is now a thriving metropolis. So what's the history of Kazakhstan? Kazakhstan is an ancient country. It goes back a very long time, although most of us probably know it as a more recent Soviet territory. It's been inhabited by people since the Neolithic age, when it had tribes of nomadic people who um, moved from place to place. It, um, it was um, inhabited by tribes like that until the Middle Ages, and since then it became a Soviet state. So as a Soviet territory, it was um, utilized as a place to send people who were traitors to the state. And because of that, it um, became very multicultural. Lots of Russian people and people from other Soviet countries moved there. So by the time it became independent in 1991, it had a very mixed heritage, very, very, very eth ethnically mixed. And until about 10 years ago, the majority of people who lived there weren't Kazakh, but in the last census it was discovered that the Kazakh population were the majority again. The languages in Kazakhstan are predominantly still Russian, but Kazakh is emerging as the predominant language now, and some people do speak English. So why would you want to go to Kazakhstan? Somewhere that not many people have heard about. It's an emerging economy. It's the strongest economy in Central Asia. It has a great deal of mineral wealth. Um, they're investing a lot of that wealth in education. It has a fascinating culture. So even going right back to um, ancient times, the culture there is fascinating. It was involved in um, a great deal of conflict in the in 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 historic times, and and some of the stories of Genghis Khan are um, involving Kazakhstan. But it's got a very interesting recent history, too. So as part of the Soviet Union, it was um, very, it was um, a very well-known place during the Cold War. And recently, it's become an interesting place to visit due to the educational reforms that are taking place there. So I think that as teachers, that's something that um, you should all be interested in. President Nazarbayev has started a school project there. He is taking money that has been raised by um, trading with uh, neighboring nations and also globally, and he's putting it directly back into, ed into education. This makes it a very exciting project. Kazakhstan's economy is absolutely buoyant. They've got massive mineral reserves, and they have healthy trade with China and Russia and with the Commonwealth of Independent States, which are some of the former Soviet states that have now become independent and um, are using relationships with neighboring states to kind of strengthen their economic power in the world, kind of like the EU in the early days. So Kazakhstan's investment in education is primarily evident in the Nazarbayev intellectual school systems. So these are initiative of the president. And they're an example of how 
President Nazarbayev wants to learn from some of the mistakes that other countries who've acquired wealth from natural resources have made. So some of the Gulf states are now trying to invest in education as their oil reserves are running out and there's a realization that there's a need, a need for other qualities in the country and that there's a need to, to invest in, intellect, in an intellectual future. President Nazarbayev is investing in that future now, so rather than waiting until the oil reserves run out, he's looking at the intellectual future of the children of Kazakhstan and investing a great deal of money in ensuring that that, that, that is assured. The Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools are currently seven schools, which will grow to 20 by the end of 2014. Interestingly, it's a trilingual project and we believe that it's the only trilingual educational project in the world. So children are being taught and young people in secondary schools are being taught in Kazakh, Russian and English. So some of the, um, the subjects are all taught to them in all three languages. The students are all driven academic students. They're specially selected and they're selected for their gifted and talented qualities. So although the schools are not fee paying, they're all completely funded by the state, they are selected and the children are gifted and talented students. These are students who are driven, they're very academic, there are very few behavioural problems and that makes it a real pleasure for teachers who go to work in the project. So the Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools are currently seeking teachers of the following subjects. We're looking for some primary and elementary school, subject, um, school teachers, as well as art, biology, chemistry, economics, geography, history, information technology, physics, English language and literature, and maths. And they're also looking for a number of librarians. And what kind of people are they looking for? Okay, you're going to need to be a qualified teacher in the first instance, so you should be qualified with either a Bachelor of Education or with an undergraduate degree and a teaching qualification. So that would be the equivalent of a PGCE in the UK or a PGDE in Ireland, for example. You should have a minimum of four years of solid teaching experience, so you, your teaching experience should preferably be for in a, a small number of schools, it shouldn't ideally be supply teaching. You also need to have some personal quality, so it's important to be a resilient person, a natural problem solver and a true educator. So passion and enthusiasm and an ab ability to steer change in these schools are really desirable. So when we say re resilient, it's probably important to do some research before you start looking into going to Kazakhstan about what kind of a place it is. That would include looking at perhaps the weather and the way that Kazakh people eat, so the foods that are available. As a teacher in the, in the, the Nazbayev Intellectual Schools, you, you're going to be expected to immerse yourself in the culture of the country and be really part of, part of the community. Kazakhstan has um, a beautiful summer. You'll have lovely weather in the summer. It's spring there at the moment and it's 21 degrees. They have a very cold winter and they expect a great deal of snowfall. But the country is very well prepared for this and they're equipped for that and they expect it every year. So it's a good idea to do your research before you look into going to Kazakhstan. And also, if you decide that it is for you and you make an application, it's a good idea to do some research into how people live there. For example, it wouldn't be wise to buy winter clothes in Britain to take to Kazakhstan because you just wouldn't be very well prepared. It would make much more sense to buy your clothes for Kazakhstan when you arrive there. So that's just one example of a way that you can prepare to live there. So what are the rewards if you're successful in obtaining a position at the Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools? Well, the salaries start at $4,000 per month. That's United States dollars. Um, I went on to expatistan.com today, which is a website that does cost of living comparisons. And um, according to expatistan.com today, Astana is 51% cheaper to live in than London. So you can um, use that information to work out how much $4,000 a month is worth to you in real terms if you're living in Kazakhstan. 
Also bear in mind that Astana is the capital city, so it's most likely to be the most expensive part of Kazakhstan to live in. The schools will provide you with accommodation. I've seen some photographs of the accommodation that um, one of the teachers that I helped to find a job last year is living in, and it's very, very modern, quite idiosyncratic because the furniture is provided um, by um, from Kazakh stores, so it doesn't look like Western furniture does, but it looks very nice. It's just different, uh, but the the accommodation looks very modern, very clean. Um, I would be quite happy to live there myself. Your flights are reimbursed. It's a renewable one-year contract, so assuming that you enjoy your year in Kazakhstan, you can renew. But if you find that a year is enough you're not tied into a very long contract. I think that one of the greatest rewards is that you're really contributing to the country's intellectual future. I think that a project like the Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools is a real opportunity in that having a part, playing a part in genuinely changing the educational system in a country from what has in the past been a very chalk and talk system, so a system that not only didn't encourage child-centered learning, but actually discouraged children from making inquiries. If you think about um, perhaps the way the Soviet Union was run, you'll understand that inquiry was not something that was encouraged in schools. And this is being turned around completely, so this is a completely inquiry-based program. It's very exciting to be part of something like that, and you have the opportunity to change not only children's lives, but whole communities and whole generations. I think that's possibly one of the most rewarding things about the project. You'll also be working with some of the world's most passionate educators. Some of the educational leaders that Teach Anywhere have helped to find positions on this project are really world-class thinkers. And I think having the opportunity to be led and directed by people with this kind of passion and knowledge and verb for education is also a, a really fabulous opportunity. So if you want to apply for a position on the Nazarbayev Intellectual School project, what should you do next? Well, first of all, have a look at the vacancies on www.teachanywhere.com. So if you've got the pen that I suggested that you find earlier, it's a good idea to write that down. You should contact your Teach Anywhere consultant for an application form. So if you're registered with us, you'll have the name of a consultant who's been communicating with you. But if you're not registered, please feel free to contact me. That's Lisa Clark, and my email address is lmc at teachanywhere.com. So the process for applying requires you to complete an application form and a medical form in the first instance. We need to see your CV first as well. But once you've completed the application form and the medical form, you can forward them to your consultant. There's no need to, to have the medical form countersigned by an MD in the first instance. We just need you to make a personal assessment of your health. From there, if you're selected initially for an interview, you'll have a 10-minute Skype interview with a member of the NIS HR team who will just have a quick chat with you to assess your suitability for the project. That will take about 10 minutes. After that, if you're invited for a second interview, that will be a longer, more, more detailed interview, again over Skype, but with a panel of NIS personnel. That interview will um, necessitate a lesson plan from you, so we'll need you to go and prepare a lesson that would normally last about 40 minutes, and you'll be asked to explain that lesson plan in about 10 minutes. So there'll be a dialogue between yourself and the panel to talk about that lesson plan and how you would deliver it. They will expect you to pay particular attention to some certain things like how you would adapt that lesson for a whole class of gifted and talented children, how you would differentiate between different gifted and talented children, for example how you would deliver it to a class of students for whom English is potentially a second or even third language, and what kind of extension you would require from the students, so how you would make sure that the most gifted and talented in the class were being constantly extended and constantly um, provided with opportunities to learn more or produce more work if that's what they're capable of doing. 
They'll also be looking for some evidence that you've been engaging in, in modern and forward-thinking teaching methods, such as um, the flipped classroom. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but if not, it's a good idea to um, go on to the TED Talk website and search for the flipped classroom and have a look at um, how that particular educator delivers his, his lessons. It might be a good idea to talk about the technologies that you either have used in the past or that you would recommend using for that particular lesson. Technology is a very big, um, a very big deal at the NIS schools. They, they want to see technology used by students and teachers as much as possible. So if you get to the point of having a second interview, it's a good idea to bear these things in mind. And if we get to that point and you've forgotten them, please make sure that you ask your consultant for some interview tips that are specifically designed for the NIS schools. Well, that's the end of my presentation, so it's time for you to ask any questions that you might have. So I have a few that have already come through. Um, one of them is, are there career opportunities once you're in NIS? And my answer to that is certainly, um, yes, there are. We were um, advised that there were a number of leadership positions being recruited for at the beginning of the recruitment cycle, which we've since heard are um, more likely to be promoted from within. It's something that NIS prides itself on, that they want to give opportunities for people who are already in the project and have already learned the way that things work and proven themselves there. They want to put those people into, into leadership positions. So another question is, is it cold all year round? Um, no, it's not. It's a, a cold winter, but a very beautiful summer, probably better than any summer you've ever had in the UK. Um, and a nice spring as well. It's definitely a country of four seasons and um, one where you'll expect a nice summer, but you, you know, you'll also expect a challenging winter. So my next question is, will I know which school I will be working at? Yes, you will. Initially, you'll be applying to the project, so your application will be for the Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools, but when you have your interview, it's possible that particular regions and particular schools will be discussed with you, and when you receive your offer, it will be an offer to work at a particular school. So by the time you get to the point of accepting an offer with NIS, you'll know which school you're being offered, and you'll be able to do your research into that particular area. So um, a question here is, as, is, are Kazakh people friendly? I haven't had the opportunity to visit Kazakhstan myself yet, although I am going there in a couple of weeks. But all of the reports that I've had from um, colleagues and also teachers that I've worked with who have gone there have reported that Kazakh people are extremely friendly and, and very welcoming to, work, to visitors to their country. Many people don't speak English, but they still want to engage you and have a conversation with you and try to learn a little bit about you in whatever way they can. So my understanding of that question is that Kazakh people are extremely friendly and hopefully I'll be able to provide you with some more, some, um, more anecdotal evidence of that when I return. Um, my next question is, is there an age limit? Um, Kazakhstan Ministry of Education is a country that doesn't have an upper age limit for teachers, so that's um, quite refreshing, I think. Many countries do place limitations on the age that they'll accept teachers, but Kazakhstan doesn't, as long as you are in good health and full of energy and have um, the verve that it takes to um, lead a class of Kazakh children, they'd be happy to consider your application on merit. Um, my next question is, uh, are we supposed to learn Russian or Kazakh? Um, the NIS program, certainly last year, and I haven't been led to believe that it's any different this year, were um, really encouraging teachers to learn Kazakh or Russian and offering to pay for classes for you to learn one of those languages. I don't think that it is by any means essential or a condition of employment, but I think it's a very nice offer to be able to go and learn a second language, especially an unusual language like Kazakh. You won't need to speak Russian or Kazakh in the classroom. You'll be delivering all lessons in English. And um, I think it's assumed that most of the local teachers will be speaking um, some English, so you'll be able to communicate, communicate effectively with them. OK, my next question is, do the NIS schools have good resources? 
the NIS schools are extremely well resourced. The um, pride of the schools are that they have that they're, they're all new schools, so they all have the most up to date technology. And um, one of the missions of the school is to ensure that technology is used to the fullest in in lessons. So you can expect to have very well resourced classrooms in new buildings with great access to technology. My next question is, how safe is Kazakhstan? I understand that Kazakhstan is very safe. I um, know that there are lots of female teachers from Western countries who are working there in regional areas. And my understanding is that it's a very safe, a very safe place for Westerners. I know that um, my colleague last year was telling me after she visited Kazakhstan that she had had the experience of taking Kazakh taxi. And there are very few taxis on the road in, in Kazakhstan, but what happens is you basically thumb a lift as though you're hitchhiking and a car stops and you come to an agreement with the driver as to where you want to go and how much you'll pay. And the driver will then just take you there and you'll um, give them the amount of money that they've asked for, which sounds to me like a crazy system, but she insists that it works and everybody's familiar with this system and that it's just um, commonly known that this is this is the way that you take a taxi in Kazakhstan. So based on that I would assume that Kazakhstan is extremely safe and that there's very little threat um, to Westerners. I don't know if it's something that I'll be doing when I visit, we'll just have to wait and see. The next question is, are the NIS schools suitable for my dependents to attend? The NIS schools are specifically designed for Kazakh children, so therefore they're not the schools that you would send your dependents to if you were work working at one of the NIS schools. The Nazbayev Intellectual School does provide an allowance for your children to go to uh, an international school while you're there. And this is something that it's very important to look into before you go, the cost of schools versus um, the way that you want to live and how much money you want to save and whether it is cost effective. But there is an allowance for your children if you are planning to take dependents who are school age. Um, another question here is, are there any concerns about pollution or water quality? Um, I'm not aware of any problems with pollution and I think that if there were issues in that regard we would be familiar just as we are with Beijing which is another city that we recruit lots of teachers to. I under uh, my understanding is that it's um, a, a place that lots of areas are quite regional and there's lots of clean fresh air. With regard to water quality, um, Kazakhstan is very much like visiting Greece or Turkey or um, Egypt, for example, like many of us go on our holidays, it would be um, anticipated that you would need to buy bottled water. There isn't um, drinking water from the tap. So I, I think sometimes that surprises people when they go there, and yet they're not surprised when they can't drink the water in Greece. So I, I, I don't think it's really that unusual. I think we're very spoiled in Britain to have fresh, clean drinking water from the tap. Um, there's a question here with regard to holidays and it's asking if we can take off holidays at Christmas. Um, I would recommend that you um, pay very close attention to your contract when you receive it with regard to annual leave and be aware that you won't always receive the same holidays that you would expect to receive in the UK. So this will vary from year to year depending on the school year, but it's just a very good idea to be very aware of what's expected of you with regard to attendance and when you can and can't take your annual leave. I think that's the last of my questions. So um, I'm just looking over to my colleague to see if um, he has any further questions coming through for me, so just bear with me for a moment. Oh, I have a question here, how cold does it get in the winter and um, that the answer to that is it gets extremely cold so um, significantly minus temperatures and and um, significant snowfall so the country like like other Eastern European countries that you would see in the news reports perhaps does have um, fantastic technology designed to remove snow and life carries on as normal um, but it it is cold and there is a lot of snow and it, it is probably snow such as you wouldn't have seen before if you live in the UK. Um, another question here is about the level of technology in the classrooms and are there electronic whiteboards? Um, yes, there are interactive whiteboards and um, teachers are using them significantly and extensively in their classes. 
So um, here's another one about the students and it's asking, do the students sit a national exam? The students for this project sit a selection exam before they join the school and the, the national exam I believe is the university entrance exam that they take at the end of their academic career, of their secondary academic career. Um, a question here is, are there working opportunities for non-teaching spouses? Um, it's, it's my understanding that this year the majority of the roles that we're recruiting for are in regional areas rather than the bigger cities. So I would think that there would be less opportunities for, um, for non-teaching spouses in those locations. There are always opportunities for English-speaking people who travel to other countries to teach English as a second language if they're um, prepared to do that or happy to do that and as long as they have the correct qualifications. So that's always a good way of staying busy and um, earning some additional income. But it would again, it would be a good idea to research thoroughly the regions that you're looking at going to and seeing what the kind of uh, work possibilities would be for your spouse if you are looking at going to Kazakhstan. The next question that I've got here is about class sizes and I unfortunately I can't answer that definitively. I'm not quite sure how large or small the classes are but if you'd like to email that question to me I'd be quite happy to go and do a little bit of research and get back to you. I understand that the classes are small because with a trilingual project you need to keep classes small so that um, the language learning can be optimized. But I can get, get a more definitive answer to this question if you send me an email at, to LMC, L for Lisa, M for Mary, C for Clark at teachanywhere.com. The deadline for applications. So recruitment for the NIS project is ongoing, but we do encourage you to be quick. Once we've found teachers who suit the school and who are happy to accept offers, the roles will just close. So there isn't a definitive deadline, but it's a good idea to move quickly. My next question is, um, can I recommend a friend to teach anywhere? Well, yes you can and we would appreciate it if you have friends who are interested in the project, if you could recommend them to us or ask them to contact us. If they're not already on our system and if they are offered and accept a job with through Teach Anywhere, um, there will be a cash reward for you of £50 when they arrive at their destination. I think I have one more question coming and then it looks like we're finished. Okay, so um, this question is, how do people exercise in the winter? Well, in the larger cities in Kazakhstan there are gyms and people go to the gym and, and actually one thing that we did learn last year from one of um, our partners on the NIS project who is from, he's from Ireland actually and he was telling us about his life in Kazakhstan. He'd initially gone for a year and ended up staying for I think 11 years and he was saying that one of the ways that people do um, get by in the winter is just by doing lots of indoor activities so lots of people go to the gym, ride exercise bikes and just think, they just learn to think in a more indoors context so whereas in the summer everybody's outdoors they just learn to do similar activities, but in it, either in the house or inside other locations. So in gyms, in shopping malls, in, um, in their own home with a treadmill or an exercise bike, all of those things that you would expect to find in your home, in whichever western country you're in, you'll be able to obtain and install in your home in Kazakhstan. So um, I, I think that for myself, I don't enjoy exercising outdoors in the winter either, but I do have an exercise bike and um, a yoga DVD and I manage to, to exercise every day using those. Okay, so it seems like we don't have any more questions at this point, so um, I'd like to thank you very much for your attendance this evening and um, I look forward to hearing from you and receiving your application for the Nazarbayev Intellectual Schools Project. Thank you.